Atoms regularly have the ability to gain or lose valence electrons. When this occurs, the atom's charge changes from being zero to either being positive or negative, depending on whether you lose or gain electrons. But why would an atom ever want to lose or gain electrons? Well, generally speaking, all atoms want to feel like noble gases, that is, the elements that are found in column 8A. That is, they want to feel like they have eight valence electrons. This is called the octet rule. Atoms do this by either gaining or losing electrons. When an atom gains electrons, it becomes negatively charged. When it loses electrons, it becomes positively charged. Each time an element gains one electron, it moves one column to the right on the periodic table in terms of how it feels. Each time an element loses one electron, it moves one column to the left on the periodic table in terms of how it feels. When elements gain electrons, they become negatively charged. When they lose electrons, they become positively charged. Atoms that have charges on them are called ions. So let's examine this by looking at our periodic table. If I were an oxygen atom, for instance, I would want to feel like the closest element on column 8A, which is neon. So how in the world can oxygen feel like neon? By gaining more electrons, either by sharing or stealing electrons from another element. If oxygen steals one electron from another element, it now feels like fluorine. Now, does it feel like neon yet? Nope. So what does it have to do? It has to steal a second electron. Now it feels like neon. Thus, oxygen is happiest when it gains two electrons, either by sharing or stealing them from another atom. Thus, oxygen wants to feel like it has a negative two charge, thus making it feel like neon. Once again, each time an element gains an electron, it moves one column to the right on the periodic table in terms of how it feels. Each time an element loses an electron, it moves one column to the left in terms of how it feels. When elements gain electrons, they become negatively charged. And when they lose electrons, they become positively charged. Atoms that have charges on them are, once again, called ions. By similar logic, fluorine would want to gain just one electron, feeling like an F minus ion, which doesn't really sound like a very good grade at school, but is a wonderful grade if you're a fluorine atom. Chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine also similarly want to gain one electron so that they can each feel like the corresponding noble gases in column 8A that they are next to. Now what about elements way over here on the left side of the periodic table? What about lithium, for example? <laughs> How could lithium feel like a noble gas? Well, we can imagine lithium gaining seven electrons to become a lithium ion with a negative seven charge and thereby feel like neon way in the world over here. But that might sound a little bit ridiculous, or at the very least, pretty challenging. I mean, gaining seven electrons is a really tough journey for a lithium ion. Can it do something simpler to become a noble gas? Absolutely it can. You see, lithium could instead just lose one electron, its single valence electron. By doing this, instead of moving to the right, it moves to the left. And what is to the left of lithium? Well, if lithium loses one electron, it goes backward to feeling like the element that precedes it on the periodic table, which is the noble gas helium. By losing a single electron and moving one position to the left, the lithium now becomes a lithium plus ion. Now, similarly, sodium potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium would all just lose one electron each to also become plus one ions and thereby feel like the noble gases that precede them. So what about elements in column two? You guessed it. Each of them is going to want to lose two electrons so that they can each move backward two positions to the left to feel like the noble gases that precede them. In doing so, they also become positively charged ions with charges of positive two. Thus, elements on the left side of the periodic table tend to lose electrons, while atoms toward the right side of the periodic table tend to gain electrons in order to feel like noble gases. This fact is encapsulated very well by this table, which shows the most stable ions for the most common elements you will encounter. Hydrogen, which is shown over here, is interesting because it can exist either as an H minus or an H plus, depending on what it's bonded to. Which brings us to these beautiful problems, which I think you should be able to do on your own. First one says calcium forms an ion with a charge of what? 
The next one says barium forms an ion with the charge of what? We now broach a new topic, electronegativity. So what in the world is electronegativity? Well, simply put, electronegativity is an element's thirst for electrons. The more an element wants to steal electrons in order to feel like a noble gas, that is to have a full octet, the more electronegative it is. Now one thing that I demand of you, my students, is that you remember that electronegativity increases as you go to the right and up on the periodic table. Noble gases are excluded from this generalization. Why, you ask? Well, I'll explain that in a later chapter. For now, I just want you to remember this fact. Electronegativity increases as you go to the right and up on the periodic table. Thus, the most electronegative atom on the periodic table is fluorine, and the least electronegative element is francium. So let's see if you can do this lecture question. Identify the more electronegative atom in each of the following pairs. I feel pretty confident you can do this one on your own. Now, although I'm not going to show it to you, if you wish to see a table that gives numerical values of electronegativity for every element on the periodic table, you're welcome to click on this link. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, elements bond together so that they can share, donate, or accept, or give away electrons and thereby feel more like noble gases by completing each other's octets. This fact helps explain many of the ways in which elements behave chemically. Now there are three different kinds of chemical bonds we'll now discuss. Ionic bonds, which are bonds between a metal and a nonmetal. Covalent bonds, which are bonds between two nonmetals. And now I have to specify that there are two different types of covalent bonds. Nonpolar covalent bonds, which we'll talk about later, and polar covalent bonds, which we'll also talk about later. The last are metallic bonds, which are bonds between two metals themselves. We'll also talk about these a little bit later. Now, by way of reminder from our last presentation, elements found on the right side of the periodic table are called nonmetals, which are shown in the blue section here. And they have very specific and similar properties to each other. Most elements found in this gray section over here are called metals and also have similar properties. And the elements who straddle the line between nonmetals and metals are called metalloids, which are highlighted in yellow here. Keeping this in mind helps us to answer the question, what are ionic bonds? To do so, though, we have to remember that nonmetals are much more electronegative, that is, thirsty for electrons, than metals are. So when a nonmetal bonds with a metal, the metal more or less completely gives its electrons to the nonmetal. By doing this, the metal becomes a cation, which is a positively charged atom, and the nonmetal becomes an anion, which is a negatively charged atom. This type of bond is called an ionic bond. So ionic bonds are bonds in which one atom has more or less completely negative charge, while the other has a completely positive charge. The metal has donated its electrons to the nonmetal so that they can help each other feel like noble gases. For example, when sodium, Na, a metal, bonds with chlorine, a nonmetal, the sodium transfers one of its electrons completely to the chlorine, which forms an Na plus and a Cl minus which is also known as sodium chloride, table salt, and is often abbreviated as NaCl. The Na plus is a cation, and the Cl minus is an anion. Now here's a link to a great YouTube video showing this chemical reaction. A small piece of sodium metal is placed in a flask containing yellow chlorine gas. The flask also contains sand to prevent the heat which will be generated by the reaction from cracking the glass. Initially, no reaction is observed between the sodium and the chlorine. The reaction will be initiated by adding a drop of water to the sodium. This begs the question, why do nonmetals and metals bond with each other at all? And why is the formation of sodium chloride so energetic? 
Well, as this figure indicates, when chlorine gas molecules, which are each made up of two individual chlorine atoms bonded together, get together with a chunk of sodium metal, the sodium atoms each transfer their single valence electron to the chlorine atoms in a one-to-one -one ratio. This converts each sodium atom into an Na+, in which state the sodium now feels like the noble gas neon. And each chlorine atom becomes a Cl-, minus, in which state the chlorine now feels like the noble gas argon. You now have NaCl, sodium chloride, also known as table salt. This reaction is so energetic because the process allows two very reactive elements to now each feel like very unreactive and stable noble gases. Now, parenthetically, I think it's interesting that sodium chloride, which is so stable and necessary for us to live, is made from sodium metal, which is explosive when it touches water, and chlorine gas, which will kill you if you breathe it. Now, if we were to zoom in on an individual chunk of sodium chloride, we would see an organized structure that looks kind of like this. As you can see, the chlorine minus ions, which are now called chlorides, shown in green here, are each surrounded in close quarters by their sodium plus counter ions, which are shown in yellow here. As we zoom out, of course, we see that this matrix, or lattice structure, is what makes up the white powder we know as sodium chloride. Now one thing I hasten to mention is that Positively charged ions, like our sodium pluses here, are called cations, and negatively charged ions, like our chlorides here, are called anions. I totally know, of course, I already mentioned this, but it's very important to you, for you to remember. We should remember that these types of bonds are called ionic bonds. So that begs the next question. What are covalent bonds? Well, as mentioned earlier, when metals and nonmetals get together, the metal more or less completely transfers its valence electrons to the nonmetal. Both become ions in their journey toward feeling like a noble gas, and they thereby form an ionic bond. Now, by comparison, when two nonmetals bond to each other, they share their electrons rather than one atom completely transferring its electrons to the other. This type of bond is called a covalent bond. Although nonmetals do share their electrons when they bond to each other, not all covalent bonds have a perfectly equal amount of sharing. When one atom is more electronegative than the other, the more electronegative atom will hog the electrons to itself a little more. Let's take a look at one example of a covalent bond by comparing sodium chloride, NaCl, with HCl. What's the difference? Well, unlike sodium, H is a nonmetal. Hence, Hydrogen and chlorine form a covalent, not an ionic, bond. However, because chlorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen, the sharing of the electrons is quite uneven. This is illustrated in the following picture, which shows the much more electronegative chlorine atom mostly hogging the electrons to itself. This results in a partially negative charge on the chlorine and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. Nevertheless, the formation of this molecule and sharing of each other's electrons allows each of these two atoms to feel like the noble gases that they're closest to. As you can see, no distinct ions are formed. Thus, this isn't an ionic bond in which complete transfer of electrons has occurred. Instead, it's a covalent bond in which these guys are sharing electrons to help each other feel like noble gases. Nevertheless, because chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, it hogs the electrons to itself a little more, much like a monster truck would hog the rope in a tug-of-war with a Volkswagen Beetle. To summarize then, when a metal and a nonmetal bond, they form an ionic bond in which there's a more or less complete transfer of electrons. When two nonmetals bond, by comparison, they form a covalent bond in which they share electrons. The sharing of covalent bonds can be uneven if one atom is more electronegative than the other. And now I'd like to finish by sharing a funny story about HCl. You see, HCl is a chemical formula for hydrochloric acid, one of the strongest acids on Earth. Hydrochloric acid, interestingly enough, is not a solid or a liquid under regular conditions. It is a gas. One day back when I was in grad school, I had to run a chemical reaction that involved using HCl gas. This was done by connecting a valve to a small tank of HCl and running a tube from that valve into a reaction vessel I was running. Unfortunately, the valve apparatus we had in our lab was pretty old, and I wasn't sure if it would even work. This didn't stop me from trying, though. <laughs> so sitting there with my HCl tank positioned in my fume hood and the valve apparatus connected, I opened the valve to allow the HCl gas to bubble into my reaction flask.
As I feared, the valve did not form a tight seal in its connection with the HCL tank. Thus, gaseous HCL shot into my eyes. They were, of course, protected by safety goggles, but these were made mostly to stop liquids and did little to stop the gas from penetrating through their porous sides. The smell was very sharp, and it burned my nose and my eyes. I rubbed my eyes, and I noticed that my lab mates were also rubbing their eyes and noses, even from the opposite side of the room. What is that? one of them asked. It's HCL, I replied. My valve setup didn't work. Hang on, I then said. I'm going to tighten it really quick and try again. I did this in a few brief moments and then opened the valve again. Instantly, gaseous HCL shot once again into my eyes. <laughs> ah! I exclaimed, my eyes burning. My lab mates weren't very happy as their eyes were also burning. Okay, I said resolutely, still rubbing my eyes. I'm going to tighten it one more time and try it again. I did this, opened the valve, and this time got shot once again in the eyes with HCL. Ah! I exclaimed. At this point, I decided to try giving up this reaction. <laughs> So that's the end of today's lecture. Please tune in to my next and final video address in which I will finish our coverage of atoms, molecules, and ions.